So here we have two writers in an art gallery in honor of Culture Night. I'm Alana Hopkin, and I'm also an art critic. This is Danielle McLaughlin, who has written a book about, well, set in the arts world, called The Art of Falling. And this is Cork City Library's One City, One Book book for this year. So the idea is everyone will be reading this book, and there will be book club sessions hosted by the library and so on. So, Danielle. Yeah, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have the art of falling chosen as Cork City's One City, One Book. And I'm very grateful to Cork City Libraries who organised <laughs> the initiative and to Creative Ireland for funding it. So when Danielle and I came to look at this exhibition in order to prepare for this piece, we were both immediately struck by Michael Quayne's sculpture because Danielle's book centers around a sculpture which has the same kind of presence, doesn't it? Do you want to say what you felt about that? It does, yes. There is something in this piece of sculpture in the style of it yes. that I felt was very close to the style of sculpture that Robert Locke makes in the novel. And Robert Locke is an entirely fictional sculptor that, that I made up. <laughs> but I got a sense writing the novel over the years of what his work would be like. And this really seems to me to be very close to what Robert Locke would make. I think it's something in the strangeness of it. And it's also in the curves, I think. There's a sense yes. of flow. There's a softness to the turns and to the joints. And it's very strange and very beautiful. And there's a sense, something hybrid about it, I think. It, there's, there's a merging almost between human and, I want to say animal, but it's really <laughs> a very monster. strange beast. Yes, yes because absolutely. what is it? We're not sure what it is. And it's very much stone, isn't it? It keeps the weight of the, of the stone. Yes, and you know, I was very struck by the age of the stone because I think it's something like 350 million years old. Oh my goodness. This piece of stone. Um, so no wonder it has such a strong aura about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I mean, think so. When you walk into the gallery, I think it's the first thing that draws your eyes and you want to know more about it. And it's very mysterious in its way. I'm thinking it's invented. There's something about it that puts me in mind of the feet in those creatures. You know, yes. that kid's book, um, Where the Wild Things Are. Yes. <laughs> and this creature's feet remind me of the feet of those creatures. And actually. the toenails, of course. Mm -hmm. And I love the foot in this sculpture. Oh, the um, huge foot, yes. Yeah, it's all I out love of the way to the rest it's, of it's almost like it's, it's growing larger at the point where yes. the human touches the beast and it's yes. becoming large and wonderfully Absolutely. monstrous itself. This is the circus by Finola Lane painted in 1974 when it was still legal to have animals in a circus. I believe they've now been outlawed. Um, Finola lived in Listow. She was born in 1922 and sadly died in 2012. But before that, she had a major show of her work in Listow. They were very good to her. They really appreciated what she was doing. She loved to paint her childhood memories of good times. So her pictures are all, in, to my mind, very cheerful and very positive. And I just love this. You don't even feel sorry for the horses. Even the horses seem to be having a good time in their way. And she painted Ballybunion a lot, the beach there. And she painted horse fairs. So beaches, horse fairs, circuses, among my favorite things. So I really love her work. And I did actually manage to buy a small painting of hers of St. Gobnet and the Bees, 
which is unusual enough. And it hadn't occurred to me that bees are, of course, animals. So it's another animal painting. So I think you were struck by this as well. Yeah, I love, um, I love the, the energy. Yes. And just, it's so, it's so upbeat and vibrant. And I was very struck by what you said there about how she liked to paint happy memories. Yes. Because I find, you know, often I have written a lot about animals, not, not less <laughs> even meaning to, but I have found myself drawn to writing about animals, but I've tended to write about them in a very, very dark <laughs> and bleak way where yes. terrible things happen to them. <laughs> and I'm really struck, and I suppose it's something maybe in recent years, I've been more drawn towards that artist who managed to capture the happiness and the positive and the joy, and there's a real sense of, of joy in this. Yes, and, and, and life yet, and energy. And yet it's not at all sentimental. No. It's quite realistic. And um, just the way that guy is standing on the horse or dancing almost is very endearing. And um, it, it was wonderful visiting her to see a lot of her paintings in one place. It really did cheer me up for the rest of the week to have spent time with, with these works. So it's lovely to see her in this show of animals, because I think she brings another dimension to it, the human-animal interaction, maybe. This is Big Albert by Gail Ritchie, and it's in charcoal on paper, and it is Danielle's choice. It really struck you, didn't, didn't it? It did, yeah. I was just completely blown away when, when I saw this. I think there is um, there's such a grim majesty to it, and I'm drawn anyway, I think, to, to bones and to skeletons and to artists who work with those. And this is just so powerful. I love the way that the head of the pigeon carcass um, suggests a, a, a gas mask yes. for war to me. And that is um, so wonderfully done. It, the piece is called Big Albert. And the Albert has several layers of meaning in that Albert was a racing pigeon. But Albert is also the name of a town in the Somme region oh. where the artist's great-grandfather is um, believed to have died in, in 1918. Right. So um, it's the starkness of this And kind bird. of the, the horrors of war yes. as well then. Yes, yes. It's, um, it's an extraordinary piece. I mean, it's remarkable as a piece of drawing to begin with, but then she somehow made the claws and the remains of a wing is it very expressive. The head as well, of course, with its gas mask echoes. And this also puts me in mind of Cohn Creighton's book, Begotten Not Made, yes. because in that book, Cohn has a wonderful racing pigeon from Cork as well, so called Doucha Boy. Yes. So when I see this, I also <laughs> think of, of Doucha Boy. Yes. That's a nice connection. And the carcass that the artist, um, they, you know, was inspired by or worked with for this has been um, buried under what is now the, the corn market center oh, in Cork. Right. So the artist took it back and, and buried it. Because it was derelict at that time. Yeah, I think it, 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 it was. It was awaiting development yes. and artists were allowed to use part of it as studios, I okay. think. But yes, it's, it's very impressive. And just as a piece of exhibition making, it's a wonderful centerpiece for this end of the room. It would certainly draw people in. And even the way that the bones of the arm, it strikes me like yes. a sword and we have the effect of, of armor. So we have this 
this forage going going into war. Absolutely. So here is Patrick Hennessy's cat. Um, that's Patrick Hennessy in the dark glasses. And it was painted in 1978, towards the end of his life. He died in 1980. And he was never really that successful in his lifetime. I mean, he did well enough, but I think it's only now that people are coming to appreciate what an interesting artist he is. And I have a personal connection to him in that there's a picture in the Limerick, Limerick City Gallery of the quay in Summer Cove, now known for the location of the Bowman restaurant. But there's a painting of his that could only possibly have been painted from my mother's sitting room. <clears throat> and I was there in Limerick City Gallery thinking, wow, how could this have happened? So, I did some research and it turned out he was a friend of Elizabeth Bowen and Ursula Vernon who lived in Summer Cove and Elizabeth Bowen had introduced him and Ursula had found him a house to rent which my mother later bought. So he lived in our house for quite some time and painted some wonderful pictures of Summer Cove, one of which is in the AIB collection that still exists, I think they sold it but it was in the AIB collection. And um, his work tends to be great fun. He also painted two old women in Kinsale in the typical Kinsale cloaks in Desmond Castle, which is a much loved painting among those of us who live in Kinsale. But this one I think is just such fun with the, the super realistic cat and the little bit of somewhere foreign looks to me like, I don't know where that is, the teacup and the orange and his self-portrait, so. Yeah, it is so clever, isn't it? And yes. Fun, fun is the word, because I think he's, he's playing around with things here. His self-portrait is, it's almost like he's distancing himself in that painting by having the portrait of himself yes. shown in, in another painting or piece, if, if you like. It's like from a catalogue, I think. It looks like it was a show, yes, yeah. or a sale. So he's at that slight distance from us viewing it, but the cat isn't. The cat <laughs> is right there in the foreground. And it's almost like the cat has taken a little bit of the stage, or, and of course, this is what he wants to do. He has put yes. the cat in the front of the stage. So it's like an artist stepping back a little bit and um, asking us to look at this cat, I think. And what is the cat looking at? Too? Is it about to pounce or it's, run away? Yeah, the cat has its sights on something and there's great determination in yes. that cat's expression. And I also love the way this little piece of orange peel is just barely holding on by the tiniest little yeah. thread of peel and it's about to go it's just barely there and you know i love the proximity of that cat's tail to the china cup as well and because, the jug mm -hmm. with the brushes yes because there's so much energy in yeah. that cat in the foreground Absolutely. of the painting and there is just this sense that one flick of that cat's tail we can even see the hairs yes. standing up on the cat's tail and that cup is gone and the orange is finally thrown off the shelf and as you say the artist's brushes are you know th thrown aside yes anything could happen and i think there's so much going on there that makes us think about the artist yeah. and the making of art and the span of a life of making art. And at the same time, it just reminds me of my cat at home oh, who will good. come along and jump on my desk when I'm trying to work and literally lie across the keyboard yes, or try do. and paw at my screen when I'm working. So the cat is very much me, me, me. It's all about me. So And it just shows how much you can have in an animal painting because as a genre, it's maybe thought of something as something rather simple. Um, but this is very complicated yeah. and we're only scratching the surface yes. of what's going on there. So 
well done, Patrick. Yes, and you know, well done, Patrick, um, because again, like Fanola Lane, um, yeah. the fun and the, there's a sense of playfulness Absolutely. to this, I think. And I'm really loving animals being worked with in art in a way that is not, as I sometimes tend to write for myself, uh, you know, bleak and dark, and they can be bleak and dark too, and that's yes. wonderful, but it's good to see the, uh, the other side, um, the happier, brighter side being embraced as well. The Art of Falling is set in the art world and it's set in Cork, so it's really special to have this opportunity to read from the book here in the Crawford Art Gallery. In the exhibition, Menagerie, Animals by Artists, and I find in my writing I'm constantly drawn, um, without even realising it, to writing about animals. They featured a lot in my short story collection, Dinosaurs and Other Planets, and animals also found their way into the art of falling. So it's lovely to be reading here, um, surrounded by art and representations of animals. And as part of this exhibition, the fifth class students of Blarney Street CBS created animal drawings and these animal drawings feature around the walls of the exhibition and they're really wonderful. To, I'm going to read a little section that gives us an idea of the main piece of sculpture that features in the Art of Falling. It's a piece of sculpture called the Chalk Sculpture. So I'm just going to read a little passage about that. The Chalk sculpture stood in the middle of the room. It had achieved notoriety some years before. When it came to be regarded as embodying fertility powers, the public had sought it out in their hundreds. They came in a spirit of supplication, less to marvel at what critics had described as the piece's gritty transcendence, its alien unsettling beauty, than to plead their case. Nessa walked over and touched a hand to the swell of the figure's belly. The sculpture had once languished for a period in a disused cowshed in Clonakilty, before the farmer, reportedly tired of it, delivered it by tractor and trailer back to the lock women, Robert Locke being dead by then. Nessa touched a finger to the indent in the centre of the chalk white belly. A groove had formed from the already water-damaged gypsum being eroded by the hands of pilgrims. Nessa wondered about these people, who'd flocked not to consider Robert Locke's genius, but to beg for babies. She had rescued the sculpture from such indignities. But when the gallery had set about acquiring it, parts still had a dungish tinge from the years in the cowshed. The conservationist had spent days with a small brush engaged in the complicated process of cleaning without erasing. When she was younger and a student of art history, Nessa had written her thesis on Locke. There were many theories on why the sculpture didn't have a face, and she had critically analyzed all of them. Looking at the figure now, she was no nearer to understanding why Locke had left the head as a block of unchiseled stone, and yet made one foot so miraculously detailed that even now, all these years later, after all the erosions of air and cow breath, all the indignities of Loretta's cleaning solvents before she knew better, it was still possible to see the trace of a hair on the big toe and the amphibian webbing of the two smallest ones. 